Um, last week I mentioned that, uh, you know, in a world that is looking for hope, in a world that has questions, in a world that needs care in so many different ways, Jesus is worth pursuing. And I hope that you're uh, choosing to join us in that. You know, our staff have kind of started, you know, digging in and walking along through the uh, book of John. And, uh, and as a team, that's something that's really important to us. And so we are excited that, that this may be something that you might want to get involved in as well. And because it, it kind of seems strange to me that the most influential person who ever lived, you know, is someone who so many people have very different ideas about, you know? There are a few things, I think, no matter where you are on the spectrum, whatever you believe about Jesus, there are a few things that I think we can all agree on. Um, there, are th- there are things that, that, that we know um, that we know that Jesus, for instance, we know that Jesus lived. We, we recognize that we can find him in ancient books that were written by his friends. We can also find the person of Jesus written in ancient books by people who were not interested at all in what he had to say. Uh, historians at the time of his life acknowledged or, or, or shortly after acknowledged that there was a man named Jesus. Uh, they acknowledged that he was eventually crucified um, as, uh, as he was leading and growing this group of people. They also acknowledged that there were at least, at the very least, there were rumors of him coming back to life. Uh, all of these things are things that are common to history and we can kind of get our heads around. We also know right, you know, for, with certainty, we recognize that there are lots of people who began following Jesus in those early days. Uh, this wasn't a movement that began with a, a bang. It kind of began in a very sort of uh, grassroots kind of quiet way and began to build and build and build and more and more people began to follow him. In fact, we recognize that there are more than 2 billion people today who follow this person, Jesus, who lived over 2,000 years ago. And so there are certain things that we can know about who Jesus was, but, but, but you know what I want us to do for a moment, and you got a little bit of participation here, I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird, just think in your mind. I want, you to, I want you to think about who it is or what's the picture that you have in your mind when I say think about Jesus. If I'm asking you to think about or picture Jesus in your mind, just take a moment and picture Jesus for me. Just think about him. And then I want to ask you, what is that picture that was presented for you? What, what was that idea that you started thinking about? Do you, do you picture Jesus as smiling? Do you, do you immediately picture Jesus maybe on the cross? When you close your eyes and think about Jesus, do you see him sort of in a position as if he's being painted like maybe a painting you saw as you were growing up that was hanging on a wall in a church basement somewhere? Or maybe you picture, you, your mind immediately goes to the new movies that have been uh, you know, put out there and, and some of the different depictions of Jesus in, in, uh, in movies. And maybe for you, he's talking to a large crowd or in a boat or whatever it is. What I'm trying to get at is that we all have these ideas or we have these pictures in our mind of who Jesus is. And, and many of these ideas have been with us for a very, very long time. And some of us grew up in the church, and, and we think, when we think of Jesus, maybe we think of him as sort of a paper cutout on a flannel board, and, and, you know, for some reason, and I don't know if I'm the only person here, but whenever I saw Jesus depicted in church when I was younger, he always had a blue sash. I don't know what that was about. Very stylish. Um, and depending on the tradition you grew up in, maybe you have a picture of Jesus that perhaps you wouldn't want to share necessarily with everybody. You know, maybe you have some ideas that you might not say out loud, but if you really start thinking about your own life, you start to, you picture him in a certain way. You know, maybe for you, you uh, grew up in a tradition and, and you grew up in a place where, where you kind of got the sense that Jesus was watching your every move and that he was just waiting for you to trip up. You know, maybe even today you have that perspective about who Jesus is, if you were really honest with yourself. Maybe, maybe you think about Jesus as sort of a genie who's going to grant you your wishes, or maybe you think of him as a, a, a just simply a great teacher, someone who, you know, had some snappy comebacks and a memorable line or two, but that was all he was. And whatever it is, you have this picture. And what I want to ask you this morning is, is, is how confident are you in that picture of Jesus that you have in your mind? In other words, you know, are you willing to challenge your own idea about what Jesus was really like or who Jesus might have been? 
Uh, last week we started a series, and you know this, we were looking through the book of John, and, and John is an eyewitness account of one of Jesus' closest friends who, who, who wrote down and shared about the life of Jesus. He wrote about this influential person in history, and, and I hope that as we go through this book, here, my prayer for all of us, whether it's your first time reading it or whether you've read it a hundred times, my, my prayer for every single one of us is that we are prepared to be surprised by the character of Jesus that we would be prepared to be surprised by what we find. Because we are influenced by so much when it comes to what we believe about who Jesus was. And and sometimes what happens is these opinions about Jesus begin to develop a little bit of a crust, if you know what I mean. They develop such a crust that that we are, are, are reluctant to begin to change our understanding of who he might have been. Whether we have a positive or a negative uh, uh, idea of who he was, we kind of create this crust around him and we say, you know what, I'm not really interested in changing. But when we go back to these original sources, like we're doing through the book of John, you know, our challenge is to, to broaden our perspective and start thinking bigger about who this person may have been. Because I believe that we may, at times, often be surprised by the character of Jesus. And I think if we're prepared to be surprised by Jesus, then we begin to understand him more. And I think for, for all of us, it gives us, you know, an opportunity for him to have a greater impact on our day-to-day lives. So this morning, as we began, you heard a story, and it was a bit of a surprising account right at the beginning of John's book. If you've been tracking with us, this was the reading, I think, maybe for Thursday. Um, but if you got your Bibles with you this morning, I want you to open them up, turn them on. We're going to look at uh, John chapter 2 this morning, and it's on page 1050, I believe, in those black Bibles that are in front of you. And, and I think, you know, as we, as we hear this account, and I'm not going to read it again, we, you know, we hear this account of this wedding that's going on, and I think it's a bit, you know, for, for a lot of us, it might be kind of a random sort of story. It seems just kind of out there. It's something that Jesus did one time. But, but let me recap for a second, because as I mentioned last week, what we can see in the book of John is, is that the author was trying to do something very specific. And we can actually see that in John chapter 20. If you flip over, you can just kind of follow, see it on the screen behind me. But John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, uh, essentially in verse 31, it says, but these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. So John's not trying to, you know, cover anything up. He's saying, here's what I'm trying to do. I want you to know about Jesus so that you would, one, believe who he was, believe that he was the son of God. Number two, by believing, have life, have life, like something that is incredible. In other words, every account that we read in these, in these pages was there on purpose, with purpose, And I don't think we can miss this. So when we come to a story that seems kind of random, it's Jesus just showing up at a wedding, it is anything but. Because John has clearly put this in the book because he wants you to pay attention. There's something going on in this passage that's worth us digging into and finding out about. So what's the point of this story? See, John, in John 1, what we saw was, was that, that he laid out his thesis, right? And we, he, he talked about this, this incredible plan that he had for the world, and he explained who Jesus was and who we were and who, what was going on in the world. And, and so he kind of creates this bigger picture and says, Jesus is worth pursuing. And then in the very next little bit, he, you know, he kind of gathers his disciples together, and then all of a sudden, he, sort of, he, he lays out this story, and he's saying, I'm going to show you in a nutshell who this person is. And I got perfect story for it. There was this one time. And then he goes into this account of this incredible um, uh, miracle, this sign that happened at Cana. And what we can see is we look down right towards the end of this passage, right in verse 11. Um, it says that what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first sign through which his, his, he revealed his glory and his disciples believed him. So John included this account because what Jesus did here was the first sign, and notice that word, through which he revealed his glory. And, and many people, as they look at these accounts, they refer to signs and miracles and kind of the same, um, they sort of refer to them interchangeably. But, but the word that he uses here is sign, and I think that's important because what we see here is that he was pointing specifically to Jesus in a very important way. And I think that we'll see in, it's maybe even a surprising way. 
So John chapter two, you know, what we see is that it begins on the third day. And, and what that means to us is that it, it happened very shortly after uh, John was, was um, brought into the public eye by John the Baptist, or Jesus was brought in by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said, here's the one, here's the lamb, here's the guy that I've been talking about. And Jesus shows up on the scene and he begins to gather his followers. And it's a few days after this, this announcement that Jesus ends up at this wedding in Cana. And, and he shows up at the wedding, and it might have been a friend of the family, what we recognize by the, the context. You know, uh, Cana was actually very close to Nazareth, and Mary was, seemed to be very involved in this wedding, and so it was probably a family friend or someone they knew well. But Jesus was invited to this, this wedding, and, and everybody kind of shows up. And, and this wedding at this time was an absolutely huge ordeal. If you didn't come uh, from a lot of means, if you didn't have a lot of money at that time, your wedding was the biggest party, the most important event of your entire life. This this would go on for days. It was a celebration that would last, and, and it was something that the whole town kind of showed up for. It was this incredible, incredible party that was going on. But all of a sudden, at this wedding, things go, and it go sideways because, because they run out of wine. So they run out of this wine, and, and this may sound a little bit like an inconvenience to some of us in North America, but, but what we need to understand in the context is that in a shame-honor culture that existed at that time in that first century Palestine— this was a, an enormous deal. This, this was something that was so significant. There are some commentators who even suggest that litigation was possible for people who, um, you know, who weren't able to or failed to provide what was needed for the party. Uh, you know, the point is that having no wine was a huge, huge problem. And, and so something needed to be done. And so Jesus' mother saw what was going on. She recognized the problem and she turns to her son and she says, we don't have any wine. And essentially what she's saying is, can you do something about this? And, and Jesus responds to her and, and he says, you know, my hour has not yet come. And, and, I, and I really believe that what he's saying as he mentions this is he's thinking to something future. A lot of people, when we look at this passage, we say, okay, what is he talking about when he says my hour has not yet come? And is it, is, it time, is it not time for me to kind of present myself yet? Or is he talking about something in the future? And I think what John uses, that when he uses this idea of my hour has not yet come, what he's talking about is, is something that's further down the road. And I believe what was going on in Jesus' mind is he is kind of coming into his public ministry. He's beginning to display who he was. He's showing up at this wedding. There's all kinds of things that are going on around him. And he's got this idea in his mind, I know where this is heading. And all of a sudden, he's kind of snapped out of this thought by his, his mom who's asking him something. And so he responds with this, this, you know, kind of comment about the future and something that's going to happen. And I think what John meant to do was connect what was going to happen to this death, uh, Jesus' death on the cross, which was so crucial, as we know, um, in terms of our faith. But so, so he responds to her, and, and I don't know what Mary expected her son to do, uh, but he responds, and then he, 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 um, he notices these stone jars that are over in the corner. And, and they're big ones. They're used for ceremonial washing, and, and, and it was important that they were used for ceremonial washing. We'll get to that later. But he says to the, the servants who are around him, they said, he goes, go fill them up. Fill them right to the brim with water. And so they fill these things up, and then he says, okay, now go and take the water that's there and take it to the, the, you know, the guy who's in charge, the master of the banquet. And so, like, time out here for a second. He's just like, there's like big jugs of stagnant water sitting in the corner. There's a couple of bucketfuls of fresh water that's kind of been poured in there. And he's telling the servant, you just take out a scoop and go take it to the, to the master of the banquet. That's weird, okay? So they're thinking to themselves, really? Like, you know what this is, right? Like, this is for washing hands. This isn't for drinking, right? And, but the crazy thing is they do it, right? In the passage, they just kind of take the water and they go right to the guy and they give it to him. I don't know if they're laughing or what, but he drinks it and all of a sudden it's wine and he starts to get all excited about how incredible this wine is. And so Jesus has done something that's absolutely incredible. It's a sign of who he was. And it's important in the beginning of this passage of John, of this book of John, because he's explaining in a nutshell who Jesus was in a bit of a surprising way. And so it was this moment that Jesus began to present himself to this world. Um, see, so there's a lot of things in this passage. And, and, you know, by the way, just an aside here as well, with, the, with an account like this at the beginning of the book, it's a reminder again about how we recognize that the Bible is full of these eyewitness accounts. And these are things that actually happened. And part of the reason why we can have a little bit of faith in this idea is that if you were writing a biography of the most important person in the world, you wouldn't begin with this story. You wouldn't start here. You would start with something grand or something bigger. 
But we know, right, that this is the way that God operates. We recognize that he did the same thing in his birth as he came. He came as a baby into a manger, into a stable, to shepherds. And we would think, no, this is not the way you write it up. (laughs) And so anyway, so there's this incredible picture that's being painted here. And I think there's something very surprising that we can see about Jesus as we dig into this passage. And so the first surprise I think that we see in the story is that Jesus entered the ordinary. Jesus entered the ordinary. And here's what I mean by that. He stepped into a situation that, yes, It was important, but it was not going to change the course of human history. In fact, it was only going to change the course of two lives. This couple, whoever they were, we don't even know. You see, maybe your picture of Jesus is really big. Maybe your idea about who Jesus was is that, you know, when you think of Jesus, you think of him on the throne. You think of him as the savior of the world. You think of him as the, you know, most important person in human history. And all of those things are true. But if he is that important, when we compare that kind of idea to the important people that we know in our own society, what do we start to do? We start to think that our little problems, the things that we're going through, don't really matter to him. But Jesus entered into the ordinary. He came into this situation at this time to to help this couple make a difference socially and culturally in the situation that they were facing. See, Jesus, if Jesus only displayed his power in the big moments with those really important things, then oftentimes we'd be tempted to think that our, everything else is just up to us. You know, it's our responsibility to just to figure the rest out. I can't bother Jesus with this little thing. Jesus cares deeply about our hurts. He cares deeply about what has us stuck. You know, he cares about what happens to your friends at school. He even cares about your doubt. He cares about your questions. And we know this because Jesus entered into an ordinary situation where a couple was about to be embarrassed. It seems very small, but he fixed the problem. And what this means for you and I is that God isn't just interested in eternity. He's also very interested in the ordinary. And that should change the way that we approach him, change the way that we spend our time uh, focused on him. You know, what in your life are you trying to hold on to and holding back, trying to manage on your own? And what would it mean for you to say, okay, God, if you're a God who cares about the ordinary, I got some ordinary stuff that I want to lay out before you. The second thing I think that is pretty surprising in this account is that Jesus quietly revealed his glory. He quietly revealed his greatness. So if we look back at verse 8 here for a second, because, you know, as he, um, as Jesus had had kind of made this plan, and then he tells those those, uh, individuals, he says, now draw out some of the water, take it to the master of banquet, the master of the banquet. And then in verse nine, here's what happens next. The master of the banquet tested the water that had been turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. You see, have you ever noticed that sometimes God's glory is seen in less obvious ways? Sometimes the glory of God, this this moment where God reveals himself happens in a way that's just, you know, not, um, not so obvious. Sometimes his greatness isn't even recognized. And I have to be honest, like, you know, I, I have a hard time um, not getting credit for things that I've done, <laughs> okay? I mean, it's an issue. I'm working on it, okay? Just, you know, pray for me. But the thing is, and I think a lot of us, you know, in our moments of weakness where we want people to know where we've done something that's good, you know, and and you might have the impression that if God was going to show how great he was, he would have, you know, as I mentioned before, healed someone, made some kind of grand entrance, healed someone of some incredible disease, done something important in the public square. He would have done something dramatic. But if you've been a Christian for a while, you'll have stories that kind of make you smile, that warm your heart a little bit, of just little small things that have happened in your life, and you can point them back to the activity of God. Those little small ways that God acts in our lives can be encouraging and inspiring, right? I think we can recognize that if you've had those opportunities. And sometimes for me, it's an email. It's an email that comes at just the right time. Uh, Maybe it's something that comes to my mind in a particular moment. And what seem like coincidences in the moment 
I begin to recognize that those are times where God has my attention. God absolutely has my attention. You know, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't tell the world necessarily about all those big things or all those little things that happen, uh, but they're important to me, and they display his greatness and his glory. And Jesus, you know, when he, as he did this incredible miracle, he didn't wave his hands over the water. He didn't kind of say, Ahem, you know, excuse me, everybody, come on, look over here. I'm about to do something. He didn't do any of those things. He, he didn't even take the, the, the water to this, this uh, master of ceremonies himself. He just kind of let everyone else do it. In fact, if you had been there, you wouldn't have known anything that happened, right? The people who were there, nobody understood how incredible Jesus was and what he had just done in the midst of all of this. You know, one of the ways I think that we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, trying to help our kids here at, at CP grow deeper in their faith is by talking about God's activity in the world. And we ask a couple of questions. And if you're in the kids program, you know this, and you've been asking this to your, the kids in your class. And if you're a parent, you can ask this question as well. Uh, we've been asking the question, where have you seen God at work around you? And where have you seen God at work through you? And, and the incredible thing about that is that sometimes those moments are not that easy to find. Sometimes those moments are not always that easy to see. And, and maybe you've been so distracted waiting for Jesus to show you something huge and show up in some dramatic way that you might be missing the way that he's, he's been quietly and consistently revealing himself over and over and over and over and over in your life already. And sometimes we're expecting the big things and God is saying, hey, I've got something I want to show you. And it may be a little less obvious. I think we need to be aware of what's going on around us because God reveals his greatness in less obvious ways at times. In fact, often. The third surprise I think we see in this account is that Jesus showed a better way. And uh, we've already described that as, as the master of the banquet, you know, sort of got the, the wine and he took it and he responded at the end of verse 9. And he, you know, he said, everyone brings out the choice first and then the cheaper wine afterwards, after the guests have had too much to drink. But you, you've saved the best until now. And I love that. If you can circle something, if you're that kind of person, just circle that or underline that. You have saved the best until now. Basically, what he was saying is that there's something brand new happening, and it's incredible. You see, Jesus was purposeful in the way that he showed his power in the beginning of the, the book of John, and the author John was purposeful in using the story to show this incredible picture of who Jesus was and what he was about. And in fact, in verse 6, and you recognize this probably already, but they, they talk about these jars that were used, and he describes that they were the kind of jars that were used for ceremonial washing. You can see that right down there in, in verse 7. And it's hard to imagine that this was all just a coincidence, because remember, this was carefully a, a demonstrated sign by Jesus, and John included it. And at one level, here's what we see. Jesus took something that was not so great, the, you know, the stagnant water that was sitting for a whole long time and made it into something incredible. He made it into wine. And that's one level. He truly makes things better. He, he, routine, he routinely takes things that are, you know, not so great and turns them into things that are absolutely great. But on another level, he specifically took the old way, the ceremonial washing jars, and he, and he um, uh, used those in a brand new way. You see, Jesus was coming to make a new way for his people to be cleaned up, to be presentable to a holy God. He was showing a better way. And I don't know, maybe you've um, seen someone who's trying to you, you've, you've kind of seen Jesus as that, that, that person who's trying to catch you in, make a mista in making mistakes. And, and some of us hold on to this, you know, this idea that makes the most sense to us. And what we say is that, you know, on the one hand, we have all the good things we've done in our life. And on the other hand, we have all the bad things we've done in our life. And as long as more good things have happened in our life than bad things, then I'm cool. Then things are good. And so what we're doing essentially is we keep washing and washing and washing and hoping that if we do enough good things and get cleaned up enough, then we'll be okay. But the picture that's painted here is that he had a brand new way. He had something new that was happening. In fact, through his death and his resurrection, he was going to permanently clean. He was going to give us that, that, that what, exactly what we needed and give us the opportunity to be in a relationship with him. And, and so I think this is what we see in this first uh, sign is that he was able to take this one thing like water, make it into something better like wine. He was going to take the ceremonies and traditions and the rituals like washing and, and, and trying to follow religion and all these other things and make a better way. 
But it wasn't just this. And I I think there's another detail in this account that can't be overlooked. Because the, the fourth surprise, I think, that we see in this account is that Jesus provided leftovers. So let me explain what I mean by this. Because it needs a little bit of an explanation. In verse 6, it says that nearby, we saw these, these stone jars that were used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. And what we find out about them is that each one held from 20 to 30 gallons. Okay, so if we need to just kind of take a pause for a moment and figure out how much water he's turning into wine here. <laughs> so so it, this was, these things would have been absolutely huge. And if you do the math, and I shouldn't, but I did, um, it, it produced about 150, 180 gallons of this incredible wine. And, and if you sort of divide that into five ounce glasses of wine, that's about 4,000 glasses or more of wine. So when Jesus does this miracle, he's not just kind of saying, okay, let's just, you know, fix up this situation here. He's giving them more than they could ever have. He's going way above and beyond. But see, this is the way that our God operates because we'll know, and and if you've been in church for a while, you know stories about, you know, Jesus feeding the 5,000. What happened after he does this miraculous thing where he feeds all these people? What does he do at the end? Someone tell me. Baskets full, right? There's baskets full left over. And it's always important that the author puts in this point that, by the way, he didn't just produce wine. He produced a ton of it. Like more wine than they could ever drink. And and this is an incredible truth about our God is that he is a God who provides us with leftovers, with more than we can handle. He gives us more grace than we could ever use. He continues to pour out to us in this incredible way. God provide, you know, uh, what God provides to us doesn't um, run out. And listen, I'm going to, I'm going to reveal how like uncultured I am and how unsophisticated I am, but I don't, I, I don't know about you, but I've sort of every once in a while, you know, I've eaten in one of those fancy restaurants and I'm not so fancy. And so when I look at, you know, the portion size of these things, the first thing I think is like, where's the rest of it, right? <laughs> because, and, and so in, and in the, in this fine dining world, you know, that you get just enough to sort of, you know, uh, want you, get you wanting a little more and, and, you know, sort of, and, and this is not the way that our God operates. He just kind of pours it on and gives us absolutely more than we can handle. And I think that begins to change our perception of who Jesus truly is. In fact, um, in, in a prayer for the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul wrote in one of, a great uh, passage of Scripture in Ephesians 3.20. It says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. You know, is it possible that our ideas about God are just far too small? Isn't it true that when we think about it, we normally pray for things that we kind of feel like are sort of inside God's wheelhouse and we create the boundaries? You know, sometimes we have this idea of Jesus where it's like, you know, yeah, I mean, this stuff is good, but I'm not going to ask for things that are way out there because what if he can't? You see, Jesus is someone who does something so incredible. He, he turns something that's dirty into something that's incredible. And he overflows us with grace in the things that he gives us. More than we could ever ask or imagine. But I think if we look at all of these things together, it also points to something else. Something I think he was making an even bigger, perhaps, uh, statement about why Jesus had come. You see, Jesus knew that he was demonstrating who he was, and so he used this opportunity at the wedding to make this incredible statement. And and so here's it is. Jesus came to bring joy. He came to bring joy where it was needed most. And, And I think, I don't want us to rush past this, because a wedding was all about joy. And this wedding was heading for absolute disaster. Jesus intervenes. He steps into this situation And the result is what? A party. The result of Jesus intervening in this situation that was going off the rails is an absolute party. And so what we learn about God is he is a God who brings joy in the person of Jesus. Jesus brings joy into our lives. And I understand that there are times when, when, when we're sad. There are times when we are filled with all kinds of different feelings because of things that are going on in our life. But what we can understand is that there's a possibility for joy. And not just joy. I mean like festival joy. I mean like party joy, like wedding joy. 
And so often, I, I, you know, I, I, I feel so bad, but there are times when I think back to my own, uh, you know, upbringing in church, and I think about those times that I tried to kind of, you know, you know, squirt away from my parents and let go of their hands so I could run around in the basement and have fun with my friends. And then I'd get caught, and I'd have to go back and, you know, stand there with my mom and stop fooling around. Stop having fun. <laughs> But that's not what God does. That's not the Jesus that's represented in the book of John. He's, he's represented as someone who brings a party, who brings joy, who gives us the opportunity to have fun and to enjoy life. And maybe it seems like a random strange story at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Maybe it seems like Jesus was performing kind of a cool miracle to impress his friends or people at the party. But what we see in the beginning of this book is a sign that Jesus has carefully planned out to make a point about who he was and what he had come to do. And all this might be surprising to you. Maybe some of it is surprising to you. Maybe little of it is surprising to you. But are you prepared to take what you read and allow it to freshen up the way that you think about Jesus? Are you prepared to challenge your own assumptions about who you believe Jesus to be? And maybe you've noticed that your perceptions about Jesus have developed a crust. Maybe you've recognized that your perceptions of Jesus, whether positive or negative, have kind of created this crust that has boxed it in, and it's hard to imagine that it could possibly change. And my challenge to you this morning, and my challenge to you every time you come to a passage of Scripture that seems a little different, a little, little, you know, what is this all about? My challenge to you this morning is to recognize that not only is Jesus worth pursuing, but Jesus just might surprise you over and over and over and over again. And that's my prayer for you. Let's, let's, uh, let's pray to get together. Heavenly Father, uh, God, we recognize that you are a God who loves us so much that you care about the regular details in our lives. You are a God who enters into those situations and you make changes. God, you, you transform our lives. You transform our situations. Um, God, you, you provide for us in such an incredible way and, and so often a, provide with abundance. God, I pray that you would help us to be aware of those moments where you're moving in our life and, and be aware of those times and, and perhaps not get distracted by our expectations of some big thing, but that we would recognize those times where, God, you've been there all along and you continue to, to act and you continue to, um, you continue to reveal yourself. And God, I pray that we'd be open to that, that we'd see it, that we would recognize this. God, I pray that we would uh, be the kind of church that would be a place where we could uh, continually reevaluate our understandings of who Jesus is, to, to, to look back at these sources like the book of John and, and see the incredible stories of you and, and recognize how they paint an incredible picture, perhaps a surprising picture. God, I pray that each one of us would be surprised by you this week. I pray that something would happen in our lives that would, that would catch our attention and that, God, we would be surprised in an encouraging and an inspiring way. God, we thank you for who you are. We praise you and we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.